Hello, my name is Aruna Surya and I'm here with Manfred Carrer from BISC. He's a founder of BISC. BISC is a decentralized uh, cryptocurrency exchange. And today we're going to talk about Bitcoin transactions in general. And this will help you uh, understand uh, this concept before we can talk about colored coins and uh, BISQ tokens in the subsequent videos. So let me start with a very basic question, Manfred. What is a Bitcoin transaction? Yeah, that's a very good question because the general conception about how Bitcoin really works is unfortunately very wrongly sold. <clears throat> unfortunately, Satoshi started with giving the name Bitcoin to it. Uh, there are no Bitcoins. Or the coins doesn't exist in the system. And another misconception, I think, is their addresses. Addresses are often understood like bank accounts or an account where you receive your money all the time and keep it there. Uh, that's also a wrong mental model. <clears throat> and I want to go a little bit into not too far details, but there are <clears throat> sufficient uh, details to really understand how the Bitcoin transaction system works and what's truly really about. <clears throat> so, uh, yes, yeah, et cetera, it's a transaction system. Uh, the transaction is in the core of the system. <clears throat> and there are basically three different types of transactions. Uh, yeah, it started with the Genesis, with the famous Genesis transaction. Uh, Satoshi just created that, and that was the root of this chain of transactions where one transaction leads to the next transaction and so on. But then there are two, yeah, uh, when you are transferring our Bitcoin from one transaction to another transaction, that's, uh, yeah, that's a, another type of transaction. Let's call it transfer transaction. And the third one is the issuance transaction at every new block, uh, a miner has the right to issue a new Bitcoin. Uh, and he's creating new Bitcoin out of thin air. And yeah, that's very similar to the Genesis transaction. The only small difference is that uh, those are not built on top of another block. Or they are, yeah, uh, the Genesis transaction was the very first one and didn't have a previous block. Uh, Sorry. Yeah. So, uh, as, just to just to see if I understand it correctly, uh, mm -hmm. a Genesis transaction is the first transaction where um, Satoshi Nakamoto created the first Bitcoin. And yes, then, exactly. Uh, issuance transaction is the transaction where miners uh, solve a, a problem and then they receive uh, Bitcoin in reward. Yeah. So it's the in, the instant if that the miners are putting effort, electricity at the end uh, to secure the network, <clears throat> to make 51% uh, <clears throat> attack are uh, infeasible, uh, yeah, they are, re they are getting this reward as incentive to do this work. And with that, they are providing security for the system. But I don't want to get into mining yeah. stuff. It's a little bit of uh, a separate uh, uh, topic at the end. Uh, and, the and the transfer transaction is any transaction where a uh, user transfers. Bitcoin, exactly. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the first at the end are always either Satoshi with the Genesis transaction, but I think that's still unspent, uh, or the miners who are, yeah, they have the control about this 50 Bitcoin initially. And when they are sending it to somebody else, then this person who receives the Bitcoin can make another transaction and can redistribute the Bitcoins. And such a transaction consists of inputs and outputs. And <clears throat> By when you are a miner and you have created 50 Bitcoin for yourself, you have it sitting on an address. An address is the hash of a public key. And for the, with the public key, there comes a private key. So when you send it uh, to me, then I give you my public key. Uh, and I'm the only one who has the private key. So I can make a signature later that I'm are, which proves that I'm the owner of that uh, uh, private key. And when you are sending Bitcoin to an address of myself, where we said the address is the hash of the public key, so basically you're sending the Bitcoin to a public key, then you are giving over control about uh, yeah, further distributing this Bitcoin uh, to myself because I'm then the only one who can create the next transaction where I can send it to some other party. And it's basically not really an ownership, or so it's a control. Uh, you're giving away, yeah, when you are owning this Bitcoin, you are, uh, it means that you have the right and the control that you can 
create such a transaction that you have the private key to sign such a transaction to give away the ownership to somebody else. And uh, yeah, that's mm -hmm. it basically. And these inputs and outputs are flexible, so you can uh, mix different inputs or the old outputs which not have been where you have basically the control over where you have the private keys and combine it to one transaction and you can send it to different people and split it. And that makes the whole system very powerful and very flexible. Okay, okay. so just to make sure that I understand the concept of private and public keys. Uh, so the, in order to send Bitcoin, uh, in order to uh, have a, start a transaction, uh, create a transaction, you need to have a private key. And then public key is created from this private key, right? Yeah. And then you need to know the receiver's public key to send, uh, to, to include in the transaction. Exactly. Yeah. So when I when I have some Bitcoin and I want to send you money, <coughs> I need to know your public key. And I mean, usually I receive your address because that has a higher security with this hashing between. Uh, but conceptually, it's basically the public key. And then I can make a new transaction. I'm the owner of the current Bitcoin, so I have to sign the transaction with my private keys mm -hmm. of this unspent transaction output. So that's a very important concept. That's basically the money, the unspent yes. transaction outputs. When I have a, when I have received from Satoshi 50 Bitcoin from a, the Genesis transaction, would be very lucky. Then I, he have gave over ownership that I can spend it. I have this unspent transaction output and I can create a transaction where I give the ownership over this 50 Bitcoin then to you. And then I don't have to, then my transaction outputs are spent. I cannot do anything anymore with this. You have, you're the new owner and you can give it forward to somebody else. So you have an unspent transaction output, but then if you create a new transaction that uh, it becomes an input to that transaction. Exactly. And but, then it's spent. Then it's basically that. It, it's just historical. You cannot, it doesn't have money anymore. Okay. And uh, yeah, that's, that's it. And with the cryptographic part of, for this transactional part, there is only, uh, yeah, this signing as with, uh, with a private key, you can sign some data and the public key is public to everybody. So everybody can verify that uh, you had, you were the one who had the private key. You made a signature that's part of the transaction and the whole system is verifying this, that everything is correct. That's the security of the system. Mm -hmm. Mining is a different part. I don't want to get in this. Uh, and hashing is just for the address. That's just a detail at the end, a small improvement for security. And um, uh, that's not really relevant for the basic understanding. So if I understand it correctly, also, uh, every transaction has at least one input and one output. But it can have more than one input or exactly. more than one output. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And uh, is there uh, a big difference between inputs and outputs? Or like, is there specific information <laughs> that's... Can you uh, like, uh, explain a little more about it? Yeah. So the input is just a, a kind of like a pointer to another output. It's just mm -hmm. a data. Also technically it contains the transaction. Mm -hmm. And the index of the output, so a, a transaction can have several outputs. Let's say it has five, five outputs, and you were taking the second output that was uh, was dedicated to you, so you have the private key for that. That was an tr unspent transaction output. You take this output as the input for a new transaction and then send it to me, for instance. So uh, input is basically just an output from another transaction. Okay. It's a, kind of like a pointer in this chain of transactions. So this, uh, yeah, one transaction is connected with another transaction or with several other transactions because these outputs can be spread to, yeah, to multiple transactions. And this uh, chain from, uh, yeah, from one transaction output uh, to, the, to the inputs which have funded these transactions and back at the end, they all lead back to the uh, issuance transaction of a miner or the gen. This transaction. That's a very important <coughs> concept, which is uh, very important for color coins also, are uh, that uh, you cannot create, include a transaction in the blockchain which doesn't have an origin in such uh, issuance transaction or genesis transaction that would be not uh, valid. Also, all transactions have their origin in those uh, yeah, genesis or issuance transactions. Okay. Um, I... I would like to learn more about um, the 
So the transfer transaction, only anyone can have this transfer transactions. Anyone exactly. who has a private key and to spend, when, when we say to spend Bitcoin, it means to, to be able to create a transaction. Or, exactly, yeah. Okay. And then uh, the receiver only needs to uh, have his or her public key uh, that mm -hmm. the uh, sender uses in this transaction. Yeah, exactly. Okay. And maybe as uh, an extra, a little bit more advanced topic, which is, I think, also important for later discussions about color coin, is that <clears throat> this in the core of a transaction is basically a small program. The very basic is that you are verifying that the, the signature is correct. When I send you some Bitcoin, then the script is basically checking if this address uh, yeah, uh, is, uh, if the hash of a public key is uh, resulting to this address and if then the signature what you have created is valid uh, according to this public key. So it, it's a small script which gets executed, which is in the very basic transaction just verifying that the signature is correct. But this script can become more complex. Like for instance, for a multi-sig transaction, it's a more complex, it's a small smart contract already, so it's a more complex script. And that could be like for Lightning Network, there could be more advanced script types. Also Bitcoin has a script language, which is limited, because it's not like Ethereum, uh, Turing complete. Uh, so you cannot do everything like in a normal programming language, but you can do quite a lot. And uh, that's not used uh, to big extent in the, in the Bitcoin space, or the, mostly for multisig and something like Lightning now, uh, but it's very powerful. And for color coins, it's used in a, in a certain way, which I maybe explained in a follow-up video when we talk about color coins, but it's important to understand there are basically a rule set, which Satoshi has defined with the script language, <clears throat> and when you make a transaction, you have to follow this rule set. When you make anything different that you say, uh, no, I want to have not only the transaction, but I want to have the birthday of this person included, mm -hmm. that's not part of the Bitcoin system. So that would not be, it would not uh, work. But you could create a new, you can create your Aruna coin and there you use the birthday of the person. And when you don't know the birthday of the receiver, it's saying valid transaction. It's a new type of uh, rule set, what you have defined. And when everybody's following it and people think that's much, much better because the uh, birthday is really cool, much, much more social, <laughs> then uh, are you, yeah, you define it, people are following, and by that it becomes when, yeah, when by, when people are accepting it and using it, it, it becomes valuable and uh, useful for people. When not, yeah, then it was just an experiment and failed like most of the altcoins. So this, this script, uh, it basically cannot be changed or it can be, <clears throat> it's very difficult to change. Uh, yeah, so, and that's uh, <coughs> like we see in the protocol uh, development and discussions like last year with the block uh, size debate, uh, because every single node is doing this verification, when you would change something, it would fail for a node which has not updated. And we, the, the Bitcoin ecosystem is built on the assumption that you don't want to force users to update. <coughs> So when, uh, yeah, when somebody like Satoshi has his own old transactions and someday decide to spend it and has never updated from a very, very old version, it still should be a valid transaction. Okay. <laughs> and that's especially interesting for hardware implementations because hardware can be not, cannot easily be updated. So when there are hardware wallets which implement some stuff and then they are five years old, you don't want to invalidate this. So it's very important to be backward compatible. So with that, Changes in the protocol become very difficult. You can extend it a little bit, but you have to do it in a way that you don't break old stuff. And that has been done all the time, like replace by fee and many other features. Like with, that still works for all transactions. They just don't know about it. They can interpret it. It's not invalid for them, but they, yeah, they don't interpret it in the correct way, maybe, but it doesn't really create the harm that you are destroying or you're losing coins. So this script includes uh, rules about, um, uh, for instance, uh, inc digital signatures and uh, uh, just public keys and yeah. uh, specific transaction uh, input and output related information. Yeah, that's a very good question. As so the very basic rules are, <clears throat> yeah, as I said, that your, you 
you only can spend valid unspent transaction outputs. And that means that they are all going back to a Genesis or to Asian transaction. Otherwise, they are not valid outputs. Are uh, also yeah, you you are verifying that you have basically this origin back to a Genesis or Asians. Then you cannot spend more money like you put in to the input. So when you create a transaction with three Bitcoin as input, you cannot spend five Bitcoin. That would be invalid. You can spend less. You can put in three Bitcoin and spend only two Bitcoin. Then one Bitcoin is paid to the miners. Everything what that's the way how the mining fee is paid. So that's the difference of the inputs of the sum of all the input and the sum of all the output. And it always has to be a little bit bigger because otherwise the miners are not mining your transaction, probably. Uh, and also it's not a hard uh, protocol rule. It's just that the miners uh, will not pick up your transaction. Uh, and when you, you can arbitrate, yeah, you can burn your Bitcoin. <laughs> And that's a very important concept also for the uh, color coin discussion later. So when you're uh, not spending all your inputs, then you're doing it the way you're burning it for you. I mean, the mine, it, it's in the Bitcoin system, the miner will receive it, so they're not really destroyed. You could destroy it also by sending it to, a, to an address which is known that uh, there exists no uh, private key. So it's when you know the public key, you cannot create the private key out from the public key. Otherwise, it would be completely insecure, of course. But you can, uh, yeah, with some tricks, so you can create a, uh, a public key, which, or the address, which has the form like, this is a burner address in, in, in English letters. And then you, theoretically, somebody brute for could find a private key which results in that address but it's completely unfeasible to create this. And with such uh, burner addresses, it's basically a proof that uh, nobody has the private key. So you send it to an address and nobody will have the private key, so it's basically burned. Another way to burn it is to use a special output type, the op return output, where you can, that was added to enable data storage on the blockchain because there were some use cases and some need where people wanted to add some external data into the blockchain like timestamping putting a hash into the blockchain and with that with that hash you can prove certain uh yeah you can prove you that something that you had the the pre-image for this hash at this point of time the pre-image is <coughs> the source with what you're creating the hash so when you take the string hello and create the hash and then the hash is a long unreadable string hello was the source of it and uh, you cannot create, you cannot find out what was the source. When you only see the hash, it's impossible to get back to the source. When you created the hash, you're not the person who knows this hash. And that, so, so it's all that's a, sorry. That's also important uh, part in the color coin concept or in, in, in the BSQ token that's used a lot. Uh, it's a little bit like, when yeah, you have invited a, uh, or you, you have made a, basically a patent, you want to prove that you don't want to publish it yet, but you want to prove that you had it at this point of time, that you were the first to had invented the whatever, the, yeah, whatever. <coughs> and you're putting, you're creating a hash of the data of your patent that can be just a text and you're creating a hash and you're putting the hash into the blockchain in, and then everybody can see at this point of time of the, in this block, Aruna, you can, five years later, you can prove that you had at this time already the content for this uh, patent, also this hash, because every, yeah, you can show it then. The pre, that's the pre-image, so this text of, the, of your patent. And uh, everybody can see you, you cannot fake this because uh, in this time, when you would have invented in, invented it later you would not have been able to create this hash and put it into the blockchain so with that you have this time stamping mechanism which is a very powerful thing and for instance julian assange was very excited about this to use this for journalism to add some proof into the blockchain and to make our, um yeah to make uh, this data which is in the media are censorship resistant that you cannot remove it anymore that it's basically time stamped in the in history
So uh, just to go back to the uh -huh. to the script. To, so basically, Sorry, uh, all, of, all of this all of this is included. Uh, if I if I understand it correctly, like uh, the script includes uh, certain rules, uh, as mm -hmm. um, for instance, the output shouldn't be bigger than the input, uh, exactly. and that you are uh, you need to have a private key in order to send the to yeah. start a, a transaction to, to have a yeah, to to uh, have a digital signature. And then if you want to, and the script also includes information about uh, burning Bitcoin, is that correct? Uh, or is it not something really, separate? no, that's okay. optional. Also okay. there are different script types. It's not completely correct to say you always need the private key because you can create the anyone can spend transaction and anyone, anybody could pick up this transaction. You don't need a signature, but that nobody's doing this usually. So the, the usual thing is that uh, you, you're using the signature stuff, but it's basically, uh, this script, uh, which is a stack-based uh, execution engine, need to return to a positive value at the end, to a true. And whatever you write, you can create this program arbitrary with, with the tools which are available in the script language. And it only has to result in a true at the end. And like, uh, yeah, you could make a transaction where where you have, uh, yeah, whatever condition, in this script and when this condition is met by somebody who can provide this then uh, uh, it's a valid transaction but i don't want to get more into the detail it okay. becomes a little bit more complicated and it's not really so relevant it's just important to understand that our uh, the rules are kind of like are uh, flexible or you can define these rules and they get executed and only when they are correct and <clears throat> validated then the transaction is valid and then you have uh, destroyed basically all, uh, well, yeah, you have spent all the inputs, so all these old unspent transaction outputs, which were used for as inputs for this transaction, have been spent, and they have been spent completely. So you, when you have 50 Bitcoin and one uh, address sitting, then you cannot uh, spend five Bitcoin and leave the other 45 Bitcoin there. You have to spend all the 50, and when you only want to send five Bitcoin to somebody else and the 45 back to you, then you make two outputs. One goes to the other person and the other output goes to another address of yourself. That's the change address then. So you get back 45 Bitcoin. It's still in your uh, control, but it's on another, on a new transaction output. That's also the important part. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, would, would you like to talk more about the, like, the concept of burning Bitcoin here, or is it something that it's to... Uh, maybe we keep this more for the color coin mm -hmm. discussion because burning Bitcoin in the normal Bitcoin system doesn't have much utility and not... There are, have been a few uh, use cases like proof of burn, like counterparty, for instance, when they started, they used it, but it's a little bit advanced and it's not very usual and... It doesn't has a lot of um, utility at the end, uh, but in our model it has. And uh, maybe if you can mention a little bit about digital signatures. So you need to have a private key and then you create a digital signature. Yeah, uh, so the, uh, the public private key encryption system, or asymmetric uh, <coughs> encryption is super powerful and you can use it both for signing and for encrypting. It's a little bit, it works a little bit different for signing, uh, when yeah, you are creating a key, you are always creating a key pair. So when you create the key from the private key, you always can derive the public key. So you always have both. And the public, because it's public, you can share it with anybody. There's no risk with this. <coughs> and when you to sign something, then you are proofing, like with PGP, by email, when you sign the message, what you sent me, I can be sure that you have sent it and know somebody else were in between and fake the message and or yeah and changed the message and I thought you said this but it was not right because when I know your public key you gave it maybe to me and then uh, I can always prove as with the public key and the message and your signature I can verify that uh, it was correctly signed by your private key and you are the only person who can do this. So that's super secure and very powerful. And encryption, I don't want to really explain too much here because it's not part of the Bitcoin system. There is no encryption. Uh, but encryption would be the, a little bit the opposite way that um, I can encrypt data with your 
public key, send it to you, and with your private key, you are the only person who can decrypt it and can read it again. But yeah, I said that's not part of the Bitcoin system. But the public key is included in the transaction, but the in the, but the private key is not. It's it's as it's private. Exactly. It's just the, yeah. the hash of the signature that is included in the transaction. Uh, uh, yeah, when I created when I create a transaction and send you some Bitcoin, <clears throat> I'm not using your uh, public key. I mean, there are transaction pay to pub key. Uh, that was actually the very first type of transaction. In, in the very first version, that didn't exist addresses, but it has some security issues because with brute force, you could theoretically find out the private key from a public key. There are some uncertain risks in future with uh, quantum computers also. <clears throat> and it would be very bad when you see all the unspent transaction outputs in the Bitcoin blockchain and you have maybe the giant uh, quantum computer to brute force it and steal all the money then. But because or when you create, when I send you Bitcoin, I don't uh, put your public key in. I create a hash from your public key. In Technically, it's two times a hash. And then I put the hash into the, so in, the in this unspent transaction output, it's only the hash of your public key. And when somebody would try to break this, he need to uh, break two times a hash and then break the public key to the private key. So it make brute force three times, two times hash and one. So that's very, very unfeasible. And this hashing functions, two different hashing functions, they are very safe and it's uh, yeah, basically practically uh, impossible to do this. So it adds extra security. That's the main reason uh, why the addresses were introduced. Um, and yeah. it's always it's always a good idea to have different addresses uh, to not reuse addresses uh, for yeah several because yeah that's related to the security thing because when you are when I send you some Bitcoin <coughs> then your public key is not visible in the network only when you are spending this Bitcoin you send it then to somebody else for spending you need to reveal your public key because otherwise their network cannot. From the address, nobody can verify that you are the owner. Only from the public key, they can verify the signature. So with the spending transaction, you are revealing your public key, and, the, and including the signature. And then you don't have the security anymore. Because when you would reuse this public key or this address for, and you have maybe $1 million sitting on another address, and somebody with a quantum computer can hack it someday, then you don't have this extra security with the hashes anymore. So it's best also for privacy uh, because yeah, when you reuse it and uh, I know that you are the owner of this Bitcoin address and then I see you have a million uh, dollars sitting there, uh, it's probably better to keep this private. Mm -hmm. And uh, So you don't reveal your public key, uh, you only reveal your public key to the sender who, uh, who wants to send you Bitcoin. Uh, and uh, and when you send Bitcoin, then you reveal the public key. Exactly. Oh. So, uh, your public key, yeah, uh, you only reveal your address, which is the hash of the public key to the, to the sender. Otherwise, I don't know where I send it. Then when you, only when you are spending the Bitcoin, then you're revealing to the network, to the, then it's in the blockchain, your public key. And then you should not reuse this address anymore because then it's a little bit lower security. And it's, I think the privacy issue is more relevant at the current state. I mean, there are still no signs that quantum computers can break this, but privacy is for sure an issue here. Uh, is there anything else that you would like to mention uh, regarding Bitcoin transactions? <clears throat> I think we have covered quite a lot, and I think it was really valuable to talk about this because yeah, many of these parts are... Uh, yeah, you need to understand this, otherwise you will not understand okay. the color coins and the BSQ system. And I was thinking maybe I can try to summarize uh, briefly what we talked about and then you can add uh, if I missed something. Uh -huh. So uh, a Bitcoin transaction is, um, has at least one input and one output, but it can have several inputs and outputs. There are three types of uh, transactions, Genesis transaction, uh, issuance transaction, and transfer transaction. Genesis transaction is the very first transaction when the very first Bitcoin was created. Uh, issuance transaction is uh, when uh, the Bitcoin miner gets rewarded uh, with Bitcoin 
uh, after solving the problem. Uh, and the transfer transaction is any transaction that a user has for sending Bitcoin to people. Uh, in order to uh, start a transaction, you need to have a private key. Uh, out of a private key, you, cre uh, you create a public key, but also you uh, create a digital signature. You need to sign the transaction. And um, the receiver needs to uh, share the, uh, needs to create uh, an address out of his or her public key and share it to the sender. And um, the inputs, the outputs of an output of a transaction shouldn't be more than the input of a transaction. And that's uh, mentioned in the script, which is a set of rules for um, transactions. Is that, uh, yes. That's very, it's very little, it's not so much, that's, it's a no, bit that's, more uh, practical what you summary. talked about. Yeah. Um, just this tiny, uh, I, uh, sorry for being too, too strict here. Mm -hmm. uh, so there are uh, two exceptions where you don't need an input. That's their genesis and their issuance transaction. They are, they are creating Bitcoin out of thin air. And uh, yeah, it's verified by the network that their miner has found a hash. And the genesis is just hard-coded, just defined by Satoshi. That's the genesis transaction. And everybody accepts this. Otherwise, they don't use Bitcoin. So it has no validation, whatever. And um, there, it's not that their output should not, it must not be spent more like the input. Otherwise, there's a, that's a hard requirement. And actually, it's not really part of the script. It's really a, a very basic part of their transaction system. You cannot change this by script that you can spend more Bitcoin like you receive in their inputs. That's a completely hard rule from uh, in, yeah, in the transaction system. And a very <coughs> important part, what we have not talked about, uh, two parts. One is that one Bitcoin is technically a 10 to the 8 Satoshi. So that's, I think, 10 billion Satoshi. Satoshi is the smallest unit. Theoretically, it could be even subdivided, but uh, let's leave this aside. And with the current value of uh, Bitcoin, which is around $4,000, uh, one Satoshi is a very, very tiny unit. It's, I think it's something like 0 $0.001 dollar cent or something like this. So it's not exactly, but in that range. So it's a very, very, so when one, I think when one Bitcoin will be valuable $1 million, then one Satoshi is $1 cent, something like this. I'm not sure if I'm right now with the comma, but in that, in that range. So we are, pretty safe that when Bitcoin is super successful, then one million might be really realistically a uh, value for one Bitcoin. And then you can still use the smallest unit for paying small amounts, uh, chewing gum and, and spend a few, uh, whatever, a few cents. Uh, and <clears throat> yeah, and uh, the, the Bitcoin as a unit of 10 to the eight is basically arbitrary. And some people are using millibit or mubit or whatever different units because one Bitcoin is already a very, very large amount. And it's, uh, yeah, it's a little bit cumbersome to say, yeah, please send me 0 0.000568 Bitcoin. It would be easy to send, uh, to say, oh, yeah, send me 645, uh, whatever mubit or so. Uh, but a very important part for the color coin concept is that the security model doesn't, is not related to the amount what you're sending. When you send one Satoshi, theoretically, so theoretically you could do this practically, there is a limit that you only can send minimum 546 uh, Satoshi, that's a dust, that's called the dust limit. And that's just basically preventing the network from uh, DDoS attacks that you're not creating millions of transactions with super tiny amounts and and spamming the network. That's the main reason for this. But technically you could, or theoretically, you could send one Satoshi and the security for sending you one Satoshi, or so this super tiny, tiny amount in dollar terms, is exactly the same like I went send you 10,000 Bitcoin, which would be whatever billions uh, or a very high amount. So it's exactly the same security model. And that's very different to traditional systems. I mean, when you send with PayPal small amounts, it doesn't have the same security like when you make an international wire transfer or whatever. Uh, and the costs are also very different. In Bitcoin, it doesn't matter. The transaction cost 
Uh, when you pay enough fees, it get mined. When you even send uh, 1,000 Satoshi uh, or when you send 10,000 Bitcoin, it doesn't matter. So it's basically blind on the real value, uh, what you transfer, and that's very important for a later discussion about color coins. I also forgot to mention unspent transaction outputs. I don't know uh, just uh, for uh, how it should be relevant for colored coins, but um, when uh, when you create a new transaction, the unspent transaction output kind of becomes the input to that trans subsequent transaction. Uh, exactly. Yeah. So uh, not all you uh, the, the, so when you create an output, all your outputs uh, when you create a transaction and spending some inputs, all your outputs are at this moment unspent transaction outputs. And when you have, for instance, four outputs. And maybe only two outputs are, are spent then by somebody else. Maybe yeah, you send Bitcoin to me and somebody else and put it back to you. And I'm spending then my Bitcoin. Then only this one output gets spent. And then it's not valid Bitcoin anymore. But your output and the other output are still unspent transaction outputs and still the money. So the unspent transaction output or the UTXO, in short, are, they, are, they are really representing the Bitcoin as money or so they're sitting the value. Okay. And only by spending them, you're, yeah, you're, you're spending them. <laughs> well, by using them for another transaction, as input for another transaction, that's the spending. Uh, yes, uh, I think that's uh, enough information uh, yeah. <laughs> for uh, our next video about colored coins. And um, unless you want to add Anything more to this? I think that's that's a good summary and that's uh, great. Uh, nearly everything. So thank you very much, and um, I hope that you will find this video helpful. And um, check out our future videos uh, about colored coins and BSQ tokens. Great. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye.